Well, everybody, welcome back to the Storybox podcast. I'm delighted to welcome somebody who I've wanted to speak to all year. And finally, our past has, has collided in such a tremendous fashion. Tana Amen. Now, you might recognize the last name as well, but Tana herself is a, re- a very recognized individual. She's a New York Times bestselling author, vice president of the Amen Clinics, a neurosurgical ICU trauma nurse, and a world-renowned health and fitness expert. Far out, that is an incredible amount there. She has won the hearts of millions with a simple yet effective strategies to help anyone optimize their lifestyle and win the fight for a strong body, mind, and spirit. Tana holds, get this, a second degree black belt in Kenpo Karate and a black belt in Taekwondo, uh, which is, you don't want to mess with her. (laughs) Tana and her husband, which is Dr. Daniel Amen, have four children and five grandchildren. And her latest book, which we're going to dive into today, today, is called The Relentless Courage of a Sacred Child, How Persistence grit and faith created a reluctant healer which will release nationwide on january 5th 2021 tana welcome so much to the story box podcast today oh thank you so much dan just i'm thrilled to be here it's like honestly the honor is really all mine i i can't get over my excitement to actually have you here (laughs) uh (laughs) if you can tell by the huge smile on my face i'm really looking forward to diving into your backstory, talking about your book. Um, Before we do all that, I have one question. I love asking all my guests at the start, which is what does success look like to you? Well, if you'd have asked me that, you know, 20 years ago, it'd be very different. I think now success is um, really um, doing what I love, being passionate and content with doing what I love, making a difference in the world. So you know, if you can make a living doing what you love and being passionate and having a purpose, mm. then I think that's the ultimate. Mm. I love that. When was the moment for you, the sort of renewed moment that you realized that success for you was actually helping the world? Was it like this gradual thing over your life or was there a particular catalyst moment for you? You know, I think it probably was um, more of a gradual thing because obviously I'm a nurse. So there was, there was part of me that always wanted to do that. Um, But I still felt like because I was poor growing up, (laughs) money was important. And then it was funny because when I finally became pretty successful, I thought, you know, it really is more important to me. Um, I started really focusing on the purpose um, Mm. part of that. And and I realized how much better I felt, how much more fulfilled I was focusing on purpose, purposeful, um, just tasks in my life. Mm. Did you ever see yourself as a best-selling author, a New York Times best-selling author at that? When you're growing up? Not when I was growing up. There's, I have a funny story about that. Um, so when I was um, really trying to get my life back on track, my book really talks about the journey of you know being broken and then rebuilding and getting back on track. I remember doing some journaling. Mm-hmm. And, and actually, I had forgotten about it, but I, I had done some journaling and I went into detail about what I wanted my life to look like. You know, we all, we talked to so many people about creating this vision. And that's what I was trying to do. I'm like, okay, I don't like where I'm at. I was creating this vision and I wrote it down in detail, what I wanted to do, where I wanted to live, my relationship, my car, you know, what I wanted to drive, everything, detail. Forgot about it. I totally forgot about it. Somehow this journal got sort of passed, you know, from place to place where I moved. It is like 15, 20, I don't even know, maybe almost 20 years later, I was going through boxes and it's probably about five years ago. I'm going through boxes and cleaning out the garage and I come across this journal mm-hmm. and I was mind blown. I was mind blown because in that journal, it actually said that I was going to be a New York Times bestselling author. I didn't remember writing that. It said I was going to be write novels though. That was the only difference. And instead I wrote self-help books. Um, but it said I was going to be a best uh, New York Times bestselling author and everything to the T down to the city that I live in, like where I live was exactly what I had written down. Um, there were only a couple slight variations like It wasn't novels. It was self-help books and the type of car I drove because I was a mom now. (laughs) So I didn't have a convertible. (laughs) That is fascinating. I think I'll I'll get back to that in in a moment. But one of the things that I, uh, that you mentioned there was the fact that you were broken. And I'm curious, were you broken mentally, physically, or spiritually, or all three? Um, Yes. (laughs) (laughs) 
So, yeah, I mean, the title of my book, you know, The Relentless Courage of a Scared Child, it, it sort of says a lot. Um, so I grew up not only poor, but in a lot of chaos, a lot of trauma, a lot of chaos. Um, and I always thought that was sort of normal. I mean, you kind of know it's not right, but it's your normal. So you don't really, you just sort of like, okay, well, that's just life. Um, it wasn't until many years later that you start to realize, no, there's some damage that was done there and I need to do something about this. So that, that brokenness, you know, I didn't want to repeat that cycle, I think is why I finally, it took a lot. I mean, I had to, you know, some of us hit rock bottom and we figure it out and we turn around and then some of us have to hit the basement and then the sub basement before we figure it out. That was more me. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what did that, what did that brokenness do to your mindset growing up? Wow. Um, you know, as a, as a child, as a young child, I was really timid. I started to hide. Uh, because that was just safer. You know, children are supposed to be free to explore the world. One of the most important things that can happen for a child, one of the most important tasks that parents can do is make their young children feel safe and secure so that they are safe to go explore the world. If they're safe at home, they can go explore the world and develop who they are and develop confidence. But if that doesn't happen, if you're always looking for that next bad thing around the corner, which is what, what it was like in my house, I was always looking for the tiger around the corner. Um, if that's what it's like in your house, you start to hide. Mm. So I became very timid. I would hide. But then I realized there was a point in my adolescence where hiding wasn't going to be safe anymore. Um, so, you know, when there's um, any sort of sexual abuse, you, you start to realize if I hide, if I don't learn to find my voice, this is going to really not end well for me. Mm. And so fortunately, I, I did find a voice. But for me, that voice became pretty caustic. I didn't know how to balance it. Mm -hmm. And so I went through this, you know, sort of roller coaster for a while in my adolescence of trying to figure out who I was, how to balance all of that. And then I just crashed in my 20s. Mm -hmm. I found out I had cancer and um, lost everything, filed for bankruptcy, uh, quit my job, dropped out of school, had cancer, went through a wicked depression. And that's kind of that was sort of like the rock bottom in the book when things start to begin to turn around. Was it hard for you to actually open up about all this in the book? Yes. <laughs> so it took me a while. Um, so first, you know, you have to make the decision to get well. And that took me a while to figure out how to do that. Because for a long time, I would just, I just white knuckled it through life. So I'd white knuckle it through life. And I thought if I have enough accomplishments, if I have the right hair, the right makeup, the right clothes, enough accomplishments, if I have, you know, the right package on the outside, no one's going to notice the mess on the inside. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of what I did. I built this facade. I built this wall. Um, no one really noticed it. I mean, for the most part until mm -hmm. finally, it's just, it's so broken that it just festers inside and you realize your relationships are suffering. Cause if you really are that broken inside, if you really can't stand yourself, how are you going to have these healthy relationships with other people? Mm -hmm. And so when that began to happen and I have this, this young child now, um, I realized, you know, I'm about to repeat the same cycle and put my daughter through the same sort of toxic environment that I grew up in. If I don't do something about this. Mm. And so that's really when I made the decision. But from that point, you know, getting well and getting help and healing is different than thinking you need to tell the world about it. <laughs> so mm. it took a little while. I, I can imagine because right now I'm in the process of writing my own book called The Path of an Eagle. And it really talks about a similar thing, uh, like going through a lot of pain, growing up, a lot of trauma mm. uh, that I've experienced. And I'm only 24. So it, it's like a, a 24 year old's experience, but I've lived a lot. <laughs> like there's, there's just so much to it. And what I'm curious about Tana is like, when you went through all that trauma, is it actually possible to remove it from one's mind or one's life? Or is it just man more managing it? I don't know if you remove it. I'm not sure I would want to remove it. Um, to be honest with you, I healing from it. I don't, I don't, I don't think there's a cure. Mm. I think there's healing and I'm not sure I would want to. And I'll tell you why for people who are listening right now, I used to want to die in my twenties. I wanted to die. I was 23 when all that happened. Um, I lost everything. Um, the one thing I thought I had been valued for when I was growing up was my appearance. Mm. So I, it was a very confusing thing. I didn't like it. I didn't like thinking that that's what people noticed me for. But then in my 20s, when I lost all of that, when I'm going through cancer treatments, 
Um, and I lose everything that I think I'm valued for. And on top of that, I have to drop out of school, put my job file for bankruptcy. And my mom had brain surgery at the same time. So everything crashed and I felt like I had nothing and I wanted to die. So I thought that, you know, I'm wasting oxygen on the planet. There's no point for me being here. And I would just pray that something would happen and just let me go. But for anyone listening right now, and I know there are a lot of people in that place right now, we are in crazy times. I mean, just not, but it's unprecedented, right? What we're going through. There's a lot of people struggling and suffering right now. I, I never could have known that the tragedy of my life, my life being a train wreck and that tragedy at the time would be someone else's transformation later. And so that's why I wouldn't remove it. So how, how would I ever know that, that I kind of had to go through that and that me going through that was going to help someone else. And even if one person was helped, it would have been enough, but it wasn't one person. Mm-hmm. And so that's the one thing I would tell people is if you're just barely hanging on right now, I promise you, you have no idea what can happen. You have no idea the miracle that you can create in someone else's life. Mm. That is a beautiful point to raise uh, and one that I can actually really relate to and agree with uh, the same thing. I, I wouldn't change anything for the world because it brought me to where I needed to be. And mm-hmm. I always say that life has a very interesting way or more or less if you are a person of faith and believe in god god brings us to where we need to be it's not exactly where we want to be and that pain is sort of like the refining process Mm -hmm. and when we are refined the bible talks about coming forth as gold and that gold is so precious and it's so beautiful but yet we don't when we get stuck in that that painful situation, we get stuck. And it's almost like we have a choice right then and there. We can either go forward and see where that pain will eventually take us, which is gold. We just can't see it yet. Or we get stuck or go backwards. But the choice is ultimately ours. And I think the healing aspect, it is possible. And I'm curious for you, Tana, how have you been able to heal and my, my correlation question to that is, have you got any triggers that sort of bring up those traumatic experiences from your past? And how do you manage those? Yes, absolutely. And I want to I wanna touch on one thing, if I could. Mm. Um, you brought up something so that's just so important. I actually write about it in my book. Um, right. So you talked about, you know, God taking you through this journey, um, which, which I really talk about my very messy spiritual journey, um, in the book, it was, it was complicated for me. My dad being a Baptist minister who had abandoned me, um, embezzled money from the church, did drugs with my sister. So it, it was a rocky road for me to find my own spiritual journey for a long time at my worst at my rock bottom. I thought if there's a God, he doesn't love me. Why should I love him? Um, but I had a spiritual mentor who stepped forward at one point in my life that really helped me turn that around. And I disconnected my beliefs about my dad from God. Somehow I had, somehow I had latched onto this idea that my dad is God or he should be like God. And that was confusing me. So when I, when I was able to disconnect that and go, my dad's not God, I was able to, to then have my own journey. But what you said is so, is so spot on. And it's what I write about is these repairs, right? Being like gold. Um, so I actually, my favorite form of art is called kintsugi. It's a Japanese art form. And they take broken pottery and they mend it with either gold or platinum. They take the breaks and they, they put them together and they mend them with gold or platinum. And the philosophy is that you're not, we are not more beautiful in spite of our breaks. Mm. We are more beautiful because of them. Because each one of those cracks and breaks tells a story. And so that there's history there, that there's a story there. And so they value that broken pottery. Mm. So more so than even the the brand new fresh pottery that has no cracks in it, that has no flaws. Mm. And so I really latched onto that. I actually keep my dad's ashes in the Kintsugi urn because we ended up healing our relationship. And it reminds me, you know, that that the the journey is what's so important. And I I think of that as God's golden repair. Mm. And so to just to answer your question, I started my journey one with my spiritual walk. Um, that was the first step, but then also realizing, you know, I realized that you can't pray 
God, let there be no weeds in my garden. God, let there be no weeds in my garden when I go outside and not go pull the darn weeds. You got to go pull the weeds, right? But what God gave me was the direction, the strength to do it. You know, he gave me the answers where I didn't know where to look. And so that's when I had the strength to then go through therapy. I found a great Christian therapist and went through EMDR and, and that's when the journey started. And even when I wanted to quit and it was, it was awful and it got worse before it got better. That's when I was able to, to engage in that. Mm. I think what you just said is beautiful. The the pottery, mending the pottery. It's oh, it's spot on. That is beautiful. Um, and I I always say as well that um, actually I forgot what I was going to say. I'll come back to it in a moment. But it, I think it's I'm I'm just in awe really of what you just said about the the beauty. Oh, okay, I got it. So God in the Bible uses so many broken people. Yes. Such amazing things. Like you think of Paul and and uh David, David. and <laughs> pretty much everybody he talks about in the Bible was broken at some point. I mean, one of one of the most that, that, that gave me hope was that I, I would I would when I was thinking, oh, you know, I'm way too much of a mess. Like I told my friend, I my mentor, it's like I'll come back when I get my life together. Cause I there's no way God's gonna like you don't even know what I've done and where I've been. And she, cause my twenties were a mess and she's like, you don't get clean to get in the shower. That's, that's nonsense. And you know, then, then she read to me the chapter about King David and I'm like, you know, I haven't been quite as bad as King David. So maybe there's hope for me. <laughs> and I would latch onto that. <laughs> you haven't killed anybody for the sake of somebody right. else. Like there, there is still hope. Uh, right. And I think that we live in kind of like this hopeless world where they they go away from what they know to be true because of the pain, because of the suffering that they have actually chosen in their life. And but it, it's so powerful when you actually, because even in my own life, Tana, I can say that there were moments where I went away from God because of the pain. And I questioned, why am I going through this? And mm -hmm. I didn't understand it at the time, but he was just, like I was saying, refining, refining, refining. Yeah and saying uh, there was one particular moment where I was going off uh, off the rails a little bit and I ended up getting uh, meningitis, meningococcal. Mm -hmm. And um, he sort of like, I was, I was blind for a period of two days and vision impaired for four. And it's a beautiful thing when you can't actually see what goes on because it was just me and God. Like it was like this wrestling match <laughs> and he asked but, me the question. He's like, so where are you going, Jay? Where exactly are you going? And I kept fighting and fighting and fighting. And I finally relented. And, and when I gave up, it was the most beautiful thing. I, I can't really explain it until you actually go through it, but it's the most beautiful thing you can ever experience in one's life. Coming that's out of I love that. That's amazing. Coming out I, of that thing. I've had those moments also where I've just, I really argued with God a lot. Like I just didn't understand this, you know, especially when it, in regards to certain family members and my dad and um, not understanding. And, and, and it's so interesting because God would nudge me to do something. And I didn't want to do it. And I would avoid doing it. And, if, and you know, if you win an argument with God, you lose. If you lose an argument with God, you win. Right. So he would be nudging me to do something. And I didn't want to do it. And what I couldn't see at the time he wanted me to help certain people that I didn't want to help. I felt justified in disconnecting from. I felt justified in walking away from because they'd hurt me. Mm -hmm. And so, but what I didn't know is that, yeah, the help was for them, but it was me that he was healing. And it was the healing was going to come through helping them. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I almost robbed myself of that healing by refusing to help. Mm -hmm. And so that was one of the big lessons in my book was repeatedly. It's like the help was for them, but the healing was for me why do we keep arguing with God when we know, you know what I mean? It's like, why do I keep doing this? Not the sign of intelligent life, but, but it's, um, you said something so interesting. It's, it's really about, I had that same experience that you had where it's like, you know, you're, you're, you're struggling and you walk away. And, and I finally came to the conclusion that it's, it's when I focus on the world. People like, it's when I am focused on what I want in the world, that's when I'm suffering. Yeah. And so that's when I finally realized it's time for me to come back mm. because and I need way bigger than me to pull me out of that hole. Exactly. 
I think I think you raised another good point there. <laughs> it's sort of like oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. That's God interrupting. That's so weird. I put it on do not disturb. I'm so he, sorry. He's calling uh, Tana saying hello. <laughs> In that moment, beautiful. So um, it's it's okay. Uh, what I was going to ask you is uh, your 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 title of this book, which I think is a a gorgeous title, The Relentless Courage of a Sacred Child. Where in the world did you come up with this title? So it's actually The Relentless Courage of a Scared Child, but I do like sacred. Sacred's really cool. I didn't think about that one. Um, It's really, so where I came up with that was because I was actually at, I was speaking on a stage to a group of recovering addicts. And I didn't realize until that moment that my work was on myself wasn't done yet because all of a sudden I am filled with these very angry, judgmental thoughts. So my life was very traumatic and chaotic in part because of all the addiction in my family um, and the mental illness. And so I'm speaking at this, at this facility to 200 addicts and I'm like, I have all these labels, junkies, addicts, you know, my, my mind is filled with this and I feel very justified in doing so and I'm angry. And I told my husband before I went on stage, I'm like, God picked the wrong person this time. Mm. And you know, he smiles at me in that really annoying way that only husbands and psychiatrists can. And he's like, no, honey, God picked the perfect person. Mm. And, and I just was, I remember being so, so judgmental. And I didn't like myself for it. I'm like, I'm a nurse. I'm an educated woman. Why am I feeling like, why am I just filled with this ugliness? And so I stopped. I always pray before I go on stage, but as I was going on stage, I like stopped myself. And I'm like, I can't teach these people anything if I'm stuck in this place, what am I going to teach them about gluten and dairy when they're jonesing for a pipe and a needle? Like, I don't even know what to say to these people. So I stopped and I prayed about it. And I just, you know, I told God, I'm like, you know, please just open my eyes, set, help me set aside my own pride. So that if one person can hear one thing that you need them to hear, not me, but you, then let that happen because I am just not in the place for this to happen right now. Mm. And I get on stage and I have this epiphany. It's like God answered my, my prayer right in that moment. Because when I looked out to the audience, I didn't see junkies or addicts. I saw scared children. I just, all of a sudden I saw a bunch of scared children, just like I was. I didn't like them because of the scared child from when I was four years old and my uncle was murdered in a drug deal gone wrong. Mm -hmm. And when I looked out there, what I saw was a bunch of scared children. And I'm like, you know, I don't know why they chose the path they chose, or maybe they didn't choose it. Maybe it chose them. I don't know, but they ended up on that path. I ended up on this one. I don't know why that happened. What I do know is that at one point before all of that, we were scared children. Mm -hmm. They lived lives as messy as mine. Mine was messy and it's not my place. It's above my pay grade to figure out the why. All I know is that if I can get back to that place of when we were scared children, we can connect. Mm -hmm. And so I went off script. I tossed my my, you know, my presentation that I had figured out and I started to speak and this woman raises her hand and she says, what would you know about my life? You're look at you, your life is perfect. And that's when I realized they were judging me as harshly as I was judging them. And she was seeing exactly what I wanted her to the facade. Mm-hmm. She couldn't see me on the facade because that's what I created. And so here we were, we were in this like place. And so I went off script and I just said, how many of you are judging me right now? And I raised my hand. I said, I'm judging you. So let's just be honest. And then we got to that place. And then I said, look, I'm going to tell you a story, a story about a scared little girl named Tana. And they were stunned. It ended up being the most fun I had over the next two years working with these people. But they came running up to me afterwards going, I would have never guessed. You know, and how would they have? Mm. How would they have ever guessed? I made sure no one could see it. Mm. But when we got back to that place of vulnerability, of just being honest, of being scared little kids, you know, dropping all the labels of junkie addict or currently Democrat, Republican, you know, black, white, Asian. I don't care what the label is. If we can just go back before all of that to a time we can connect. Mm-hmm. Wow. <laughs> that's where the title came from. <laughs> that's, that's an amazing story. And I apologize if I got the title wrong, because I was thinking in my brain, sacred because we technically all are sacred yeah no i was just thinking that's a really cool title too i just didn't think of that <laughs> <Maybe next book. laughs> you never yeah. know um but we're all scared little children 
not wanting to be vulnerable because vulnerability for some reason equals pain, hurt, showing us who we really are to other people. And, but yet in the same instance, we are all sacred in God's eyes. Yes. He created us with a purpose. He created us with a special unique set of characteristics that is different to you and I. Our experiences might be somewhat similar, but our mindset going through it is different. Mm -hmm. Everything is amazing how God created us. (laughs) The intricate, the mind, the brain itself, which are two different things, but the human body, life experience, the journey itself, paths that we go on, our choices, free will. I mean, that just boggles my mind. And one thing that you have in your book, I believe, is is persistence. Mm -hmm. And this, for me, for me, Tana, I can say that persistence equals success Mm -hmm. because I have a saying, and I'll, I'll let you speak on this in a moment, but my saying is be persistent to remain consistent are the things that you want in your life because consistency ends up being the flow on effect of when I am persistent because if you really uh, take it and you um, un- unbox it for lack of a better term and you really look at it from an in-depth point of view, persistence is really the key to overcoming a lot of things. And it kind of relates to another thing that I have called my CAP method. C stands for choice, A stands for acceptance, and P stands for persistence. So what a lot of people are doing when they go through pain, this is what I did, is they have chosen to accept their current reality for the way that it is, and they are persistently telling themselves that they are no good and they will never amount to anything, and they mm-hmm. remain stuck. Mm-hmm. But what if we reverse engineered that? And then we decided finally that it is my choice to overcome this pain. I'm going to accept that I can become better and then I'm going to persistently work on it. I'm not going to give up. I love that. So I'm going to ask, thank you. I'm going to ask you, Tana, what does persistence really mean to you? So you in the intro um, talked about my love of martial arts. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have a second degree black belt in Kempo and a black belt in Taekwondo. So I'm going to tell you a secret. Don't tell anybody. I'm oh. not that tough. <laughs> I'm not really that tough. So, you know, black belt, we have a saying, a black belt is only a white belt who shows up every day. So, <laughs> long, oh, it's funny. I think I just showed up for so long. They had no choice. <laughs> so <laughs> they finally were like, all right, we got to get a black belt because she's not going away. So, <laughs> No, no, honestly, I mean, if you do anything long enough, right, you become an expert at it and you're, it's, it's persist, that's persistence. Mm -hmm. So it's really just making a decision and sticking with it and showing up every day, suiting up every day. I was a white belt. I'm, to be honest with you, I never thought I'd be able to, when I tested for Taekwondo, I was in the best shape I'd ever been in. And then I got the cancer came back again. Mm -hmm. I I had metastatic uh, thyroid cancer that recurred a number of times. So it came back again when I was an adult and I was told you can't practice martial arts anymore. My heart rate was too high. They were worried about me going into AFib. They said, you can't practice anymore. So the minute you tell me I can't do something, what do you think I'm going to do? That is the thing I'm going to do. So my husband always says, I know exactly how to get you to do something. It's tell you, you can't. So I, at that point was like, there's no way I'm giving up martial arts. I've been doing it for too long. And so I went and told my master at the time I was practicing Kempo. I had switched from Taekwondo to Kempo. And so I said, you know, I will never get a black belt. I'm not going to be able to test, but that's not why I'm here. Um, Because the test where I test in many places is just too brutal. Mm -hmm. So I said, I don't ever want you to make the test easy for me. I'm just, I can't do it right now because I can't risk, you know, the the damage to my heart. But I, but I love what I'm doing so much. I want to be the best brown belt or green belt or whatever it is I'm going to end up being. But I can't go through that insane test at the moment. Like maybe someday, but not now. Hmm. he's like that's fine I mean we were just I was doing it for the journey I was not doing it for the belt I was doing it for the journey 
And all of a sudden, one day he looked at me and he's like, yeah, you definitely can do this test. I was, I was back on my feet. My health was good. I built up my endurance. He's like, there's nothing about this test you can't do. Mm. I didn't expect that. I actually got scared. And I'm like, what? No, I wasn't planning on it. I didn't plan on doing my black belt test, but sure enough. And then I got my second degree black belt. You just show up long enough. Mm. That's persistence. Mm. And when you're talking about your own life, I mean, what else is more important than healing the past? Because when you don't heal the past, you really limit your potential for the future. When you're focused on all the wounds, and I don't even know if you, people don't even realize they're focused on it. No. But what happens is when you've got all those wounds festering, you're so busy guarding those that you can't meet your potential. You can't use that energy to maximize your potential and fulfill your purpose going forward. Mm. So persistence is key. 100%. <laughs> I absolutely love it. Um, a couple more questions for you, Tana, because I want to be mindful of your time. If Someone wants to pick up your book right now and just say, for example, they turn to any, any random page, what page would you recommend that they turn to first so they can get the most out of the book? So either, I would say the first page or the last page. The first page is going to talk about, um, the first page is going to talk about when you argue, when you win an argument with God, you lose. When you lose an argument with God, you win. That's the scared child. It's really gonna. It's, it really goes into um, we're all in the same place at one point, and when we can get back to that place, we can connect. It's really about how we're all judging each other, and the and then it digs into my story. There's lots of lessons along the way, right? It's easy to call people bad. It's much harder to ask why. Mm. There's a lot about forgiveness in there. The final page is about God's golden repair, and that's really what we talked about. It's like, we are all on this journey. Not one of us. We, we don't get through this life without some breaks and some cracks. And, but with God's golden repair, with that Kintsugi art form, you know, that I talk about that metaphor, um, we are better because of the stories that those, that those wounds tell, that those cracks tell that your tragedy today could be someone else's triumph tomorrow. Mm, that's wonderful. Uh, two more final questions for you. This one, um, I absolutely love asking people to see their response. What is the worst piece of advice you've ever received? Oh, wow. I've gotten a lot of bad advice. Um, so not to go to school. Mm. Not to go to school. Um, so when I was young, I was um, a couple of times I've been given that advice. One was because um, we couldn't afford it, um, that I should just use my appearance. I should marry someone rich never take that advice, decided to rely on myself. And I had someone tell me, this is a really crude comment. I apologize for this, but it's just the truth. Never take people's advice when they, when they say something that's going to hold you down, never take it. I had someone actually say to me, the only way you're getting through college is on your back. And I will, I will never forget that. I taped it to my mirror because like I said earlier, the best way to get me to do something is tell me I can't. Mm -hmm. I use that. Maybe that's not a good thing, but I use that as fuel. I'm like, just watch. <laughs> so, I mean, the best revenge is success, but that's the worst advice I ever got was um, someone trying to hold me back for whatever their reasons were. They may have had good intentions. You need to know yourself and take your own advice. Mm -hmm. That's very similar to me. Someone once told me last year, actually, he's like, don't waste your time on a dead duck, which basically meant give up. There is no point. It's not going to work. Don't even try. But if I had to given up and listened to his bad advice, I would never have um, sold the property, never would have met the amazing people that actually bought the property, and I never would have been thanked and had two amazing relationships as a result. So mm -hmm. like very similar, if you get told, give up, don't. <laughs> like put it into perspective, obviously, but don't give up if you really, really want it. Um, my final question for you, this is my all time favorite question, Tana. It's a hypothetical one. So just imagine for me uh, that you've reached the age of 100 and your friends have decided to put together a film of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done, a Tana Amen film. Okay. And they've shown it to you on your 100th birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? Um, you know, when you first started that, <laughs> that question, I thought, oof. You know, because those early years, there's a lot of things 
But that's what my book is about. It's about owning and taking responsibility for the parts of my life that I didn't like, that I wasn't proud of, um, healing from those times. But that's what I want people to be able to say is that she owned it. She took responsibility, but then she used all of that pain for purpose to help other people mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that she learned from it. Sign me up for the first ticket. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I absolutely love that. Where can people buy your new book and learn more about you? So I actually have almost $500 worth of pre-order gifts. If you go to relentlesscourage.com, you can find it anywhere, Amazon, anywhere books are sold. But I have a bunch of pre-order gifts if you go to relentlesscourage.com. If you go to Amazon, you can still you can still redeem the gifts. Um, but I want people to learn to write the story of their lives so that they can begin to heal from the past and see it through an adult perspective, not a child's perspective. So I put together a series of gifts to help people with that. A journal, a mindfulness meditation, a course, um, and some, some little tools to help people begin to process differently and look at it from an adult's perspective see the truth and rewrite the ending. So mm. relentlesscourage.com. I'll make sure that's all in the show notes below when this episode drops very, very soon. But Tana Eamon, thank you so much for your story, your generosity, your kindness, your persistence, your grit, and for being resilient throughout it all. Thank you for coming on the Storybox podcast. Oh, thank you so much, Jay. 